This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Um, thank you, Peter, Philip, and John, for organizing this. And thanks, too, to all the rest of the speakers and the audience um, for what's been such a, a great couple of days. Um, you have a handout um, in front of you for my paper. Um, I will not be reading quite a few of the things that are on it. They're just there to refer to, but some of them I will be reading. Some of them I'm actually going to have to pass over for, to try to save time. Um, just before I start, um, I want to say that um, when I'm in England, uh, in London at, at, at any rate, um, I swim every morning at the Y, and it's always struck me as very odd, but in the context of this conference especially, and Victoria's paper just before lunch, um, going into a room marked female changing has suddenly become much more sinister than it used to be. <laughs> so I've been, I've been going in kind of apprehensively, wondering, you know, is so I'm going to come up with, with branches or horns on my head or something, but I just come out cleaner. Anyway. Um, like other Renaissance countries, England imitated the story of the Aeneid to trace its origins to the legendary city of Troy. The myth of the immigration of the Trojan brute, descendant of Aeneas, was especially popular under Elizabeth, appearing in Spencer's Fairy Queen Book Three, which tells how Aeneas left Troy and went to Rome, from whence his grandson Brutus came to Britain. And this is number one on your handout, and I won't read this, but the, the most relevant parts are uh, stanzas 58 to 50, 48 to 51. In Spencer, the line of Aeneas and Brute ultimately produces the female knight Britomart, who is Elizabeth's ancestor and prototype, and who here is listen listening eagerly to the story. The narrator of this tale of cultural transmission is, however, the knight Paradel, who uses his skills as a storyteller to woo his host's wife, Helenor, and this is in stanza 52. While the names, of course, link the lovers to those who began the Trojan War, Helen is now a whore, and Paradol is a parody Paris. The scene thus suggests that ancient works may become corrupted as they move through time and space, as here the Virgilian translatio becomes an Ovidian scene of seduction. As Mayoko Suzuki first argued, the scene in which Britomart hears of her own origins enables Spencer also to meditate on his classical inheritance. For Suzuki, Ovid is a bad influence, as the Ovidian lover Paradol misuses the story of the Virgilian Britomart. Yet Spencer's Britomart is herself shaped through Ovidian myths, and at the center of the canto that describes her quest lies the highly Ovidian garden of Adonis. Moreover, for a number of Spencer's contemporaries, Avidian stories, especially those of seduction, offered a counter-myth of translatio to that of the Virgilian epic. The publication of The Fairy Queen in 1590 coincided roughly with the emergence of a new English genre, what we call the English Apillion, short, usually erotic poems based on Ovidian myths, such as most famously Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis, Rape of Lucrece, and Marlowe's Hero and Leander. The fad for such poems is framed by two narratives which focus on the movement of Ovidian figures and even dynasties to England. Thomas Lodge's 1589 Scylla's Metamorphosis and John Weaver's 1600 Faunus and Mellaflora. Both of these works draw on episodes that appear in Ovid's retelling of the Aeneid in Metamorphoses 1314, books in which, as Sarah Myers notes, quote, the issues of literary continuation, appropriation, and repetition are central. As often noted, Ovid reworks Aeneas's journey to give it an Ovidian spin, emphasizing the role that desire plays in the Aeneid, and turning the Virgilian translatio into metamorphosis to remind us that the Aeneid is at heart the story of the transformation of Trojans into Romans. Above all, he foregrounds the act of storytelling itself, shifting attention from Virgil's translatio imperii to scenes which tell of the importing of the muses to Rome and which construct a genealogy for his own poem. I will suggest here that Ovid's revision of the Virgilian translatio provided a model for English writers concerned with transforming their classical inheritance into a new native tradition and creating their own poetic genealogies. 
If the Tudor myth of English history looks back to Virgil, the poet's account of English literary history comes from Ovid. And I was thinking about this also in relationship to some of the models that have been coming up in this conference so far. And if we're thinking about the different relations between later readers and Ovid, what is being done by the writers that I'm going to look at is clearly not a correction of Ovid, though I'll be talking about that as an issue later on, but something more like an elaboration in which um, Ovidian principles are taken and expanded upon to create ultimately new and English forms. Um, and one of the arguments also that I'm going to be making, picking up on, on Philip's argument about, about Milton, is that the authors whom I'm looking at, who are definitely fall into the category you mentioned of, of those of average abilities as opposed to Shakespeare and, and Spencer, um, are writers who are yet intensely aware of both inter and intertextu inter and intra textuality. Um, the relationship between uh, among Ovidian stories and between Ovid and Virgil. Um, this is something that they, they picked up on. Now, Ovid, of course, had already come to England earlier through Chaucer and other writers who had reworked Ovidian figures and topoi. But the key moment of Ovid's importation to England in this period is in the late 1530s with the Petrarchism of Wyatt and Surrey, which partly because of its reinforcement later of Queen Elizabeth as an unattainable object of desire, set the dominant poetic love relation for the next 60 years. At the same time, and in many ways complementing this, Ovidian figures and imagery began to be grafted onto the form of the medieval complaint. Elements of Pythagoras' speech in Metamorphosis 15 are obsessively replayed throughout Spencer's complaints, as well as numerous minor works, while Jane Shore's speech in The Mirror of Magistrates of 1563 by Thomas Churchyard, who is going to translate the first three books of the Tristia in 1587, shows the growing influence of the heroic as this suggests, Ovid played a central role in the development of the literature of this period, providing the perfect stories and themes for writers who are obsessed with change and thinking about their own metamorphosis of classical works. The ongoing process of grafting Ovid onto the li English literary landscape is the subject of Lodge's Scylla's Metamorphosis. The poem brings Ovid's half-fish sea god Glaucus to Britain. Divided physically, Glaucus is also split between Metamorphosis 13 and 14, where he's part of the convoluted sequence of stories that interrupts the journey of Aeneas. The tale of Glaucus and Scylla is triggered when the Trojans arrive at Sicily and prepare to face the monster Scylla. Lovid, Ovid launches into an Aetian to explain the origins of the terrifying threat that might have blocked the Trojans' journey to their new home. Expanding on Virgil's comment that, quote, above she is of human form, down to the waist a fair bosomed maiden, Ovid makes Scylla's upper half a kind of remnant of her past, saying that, quote, and if everything the poets have left us are not fictions, she was once a girl. As Philip Hardy has shown, Ovid's aside foregrounds how Scylla, quote, had become a touchstone for poetic, poetic fictiveness, an association that made her appealing for later imitators of Ovid, such as Spencer and Milton. By drawing attention to this commonplace, Ovid also hints that the Trojan journey is impeded by fictions, which is certainly true in one sense, as the Trojans are put on hold while Ovid spins a series of tales that lead us far away from Virgil's plot. Ovid claims that Scylla was once a beautiful nymph who was courted by the besotted Glaucus, whom she coldly spurned because of his divided nature. She is therefore fittingly turned by Circe into a monster who is herself divided, girl on top, pack of dogs below. This digression to explain the Trojan's enemy itself contains a further digression, the unsuccessful courtship of Galatea by Polyphemus, which mirrors that of Scylla by Glaucus. The intertwining of these parallel stories, all taken from earlier works, turns Aeneas's journey into part of the journey through earlier literature that runs through these books. If this tour of literary history interrupts Aeneas's journey, it also, however, mirrors it. Glaucus's swim from Etna up north along the coast of Italy stands in for the Trojan's journey, while his transformation into a merman anticipates Aeneas's deification. 
Glaucus is thus a kind of Ovidian substitute for Aeneas, one of the many in the final books which offer different versions of metamorphoses and rebirth. Um, and it seemed to me that this offers one possible answer to the question we were discussing yesterday of why Glaucus appears the place that he does in Dante at the beginning of the Paradiso. Um, as, as Ingo was pointing out, you know, sort of at, towards the end of the Par Purgatorio, this is where Ovidian, as Virgil disappears, as Virgil has to leave, this is where Ovidian figures begin to come in more. Um, at the very beginning of his journey, uh, Dante had said, you know, I'm not Aeneas, you know, non sono Aenea, you know, that that is not his role. Um, at the beginning of the Paradiso, he's not Aeneas, but he's Glaucus. He's becoming the kind of Ovidian version of the Aeneas figure, as if as his journey stops being Virgilian and begins to take a more Ovidian slant, one that involves the radical transformation. Uh, that may seem probably may perhaps too clever, but I think it's an interesting possibility to try to explain the figure of, of Glaucus uh, there. Anyway, in Lodge's poem, the journey of Glaucus to Britain also inevitably recalls that of Aeneas to Rome and of his British equivalent, Brute, to Britain. Like Ovid, too, Lodge makes the episode about the literary tradition. The poem traces the transformation of English verse into the new form of the Apillion itself. The opening is broadly reminiscent of Chaucer's Book of the Duchess, and more recently, George Gascoigne's experiment in Chaucerian Ovidianism, The Complaint of Philomene of 1576, in which the narrator strolls out at night to hear the nightingale and then dreams of the story of Philomela. Lodge innovates by bringing the Ovidian story to England in reality. His narrator recalls how one day, as he walked weeping by the river Isis, he was met by the equally despondent Glaucus, who explains how he came both to be so unhappy and also in England. Lodge's Glaucus is not a merman, but an attractive and carefree water god, adored by the water nymphs, but defiantly uninterested in girls. However, he unfortunately happened one day to spot and be smitten by the lovely but hard-hearted Scylla, who coldly rebuffed his ardent advances, telling him, in effect, go west, young man, quote, pack hence thou fondling to the western seas, within some calmy river shroud thy head. While Ovid's rejected Glaucus goes to Italy, Lodge's follows Scylla's direction, swimming till he comes to, quote, a fruitful isle begirt with ocean streams, i.e. England, where he settles down to a life of miserable moping somewhere near Oxford, which clearly Lodge assumes to be the right place to pine away in because he'd been a student there. In Lodge, moreover, Glaucus's geographical journey sets in motion a generic one. When the Ovidian Glaucus first arrives in England, it is in the form of the conventional Petrarchan lover and complainer who bemoans his situation and the inconstancy of the world in stock images of Ovidian mutability. And this is number two on your handout, and I won't read this um, uh, out, but you can see just sort of at a quick glance, um, it looks fairly familiar, and indeed it's kind of ubiquitous in many poems of this kind during this period. Uh, however, while the poem begins as a complaint, it breaks free from it when Glaucus is suddenly cured of his love through the help of Venus and Cupid. Even more gratifyingly, at the very moment that his desire for Scylla disappears, Scylla herself turns up in England. In revenge for her previous cruelty, Cupid shoots her so that she now pursues Glaucus, who flees in horror from her embrace. From, it's now Scylla's turn to pine away from desire and as a consequence to be transformed. Lodge leaves out the role of Circe, and I'll come back to this later, and he also abridges the metamorphoses of Scylla, whom in Ovid is first turned into the monstrous dog lady, who is the enemy of mariners, and then is petrified. Moralists had been particularly interested in the image of the half-human Scylla as an example of lust. Lodge isn't interested in that aspect of the story, but rather in exploiting its potential as a kind of revenge fantasy for the Petrarchan lover against the unattainable female. Spurned by Glaucus, Scylla, quote, with hideous cries like wind-born black sheep, back she fled unto the sea and towards Sicilia sped. <laughs> 
A return journey that's obviously necessitated by geography, as Lodge does not completely forget that the story is supposed to explain the origins of a Mediterranean landmark, and he can't just you know, pick Scylla up and move her to England. He has to put her back where she came from. Back where she came from, she's put in her place, turning into the conventional abandoned woman whose complaint is played back to her by the figure of Echo. However, while it briefly looks as if the poem is going to relapse into the complaint form with which it began, it doesn't. Scylla is only given five lines in which to declaim her woe, and at the end, the narrator, Glaucus, and all his family go off for a jolly feast of pure immortal nectar and sweet ambrosial dainties. Everyone seems really quite pleased when Scylla is petrified through the intervention of a group of allegorical figures who bind her to the rocks she becomes. And this is number three on your handout. And I'm going to read just the, the first two lines of that and then skip down to the, the middle here, it's the, the, the fun bit. These are the figures who show up. Fury and rage, wan hope, despair and woe, from Dittus den by Ate sent, drew nigh. And then just down, sort of toward, just a little bit below the middle. These five at once the sorrowing nymph assail, and captive lead her bound into the rocks, where howling still she strives for to prevail, with no avail yet strives she, for her locks are changed with wonder into hideous sands, and hard as flint become her snow white hands. The waters howl with fatal tunes about her. The air doth scowl when as she turns within them. The winds and waves with puffs and billows scout her. Waves storm, air scowls, both wind and waves begin them to make this place, this no to make the place this mournful nymph doth weep in, a hapless haunt, whereas no nymph may keep in. Now the scene is actually remarkably similar to the end of Fairy Queen Book 3, which some of you I hope know, in which the girl Amoret is tortured by the conventions of love from which she cannot break free, and quote, bound and fast, and her small waist girt round with iron bands unto a brazen pillar by the which she stands. In both poems, allegorical figures in Lodge, Fury, Rage, Despair, Woe, Wan, Hope, Spencer's got a much longer list of, of things. Um, these allegorical figures represent the Petrarchan love experience, which makes lovers' lives a living hell. Spencer and, Lo and Lodge both went to Merchant Taylor's school, though the older Spencer would have been ahead of Lodge. He was six years older. Lodge drew on Spencer's complaints um, in his own 1591 complaint, Catharos. He refers to Spencer in A Fig for Momus in 1595, and in his 1596 prose satire, Wit's Misery, he described Spencer as more than any other contemporary poet, quote, best read in ancient poetry. In return, Spencer might have read Lodge's 1579 spirited defense of poetry, music, and stage plays, the first of, of the many defenses of poetry which were written around this time. I don't think the connections present a case for influence, however. Rather, perhaps more interestingly, they reveal the common concern of a generation eager to experiment with new forms of poetry and desire and to break out of the conventions of Petrarchism. But the parallels illuminate striking differences. Spencer's solution is to have Amoret freed by Britomart, who's the Knight of Chastity, actually, and who destroys the tor tormenting Petrarchan images of love that abound the girl. Um, and you know, Spencer's idea is clearly that you know, sort of love has become distorted because of, of human customs and conventions, and if we can break free from them, then men and women can come together and be happy. Um, so it has this you know, sort of aspect of trying to break out of customs, which is going to be a project for all of the writers, really, in this period. Lodge isn't interested in this here, however. While Lodge's work celebrates liberation from restricting love, at least in the case of Glaucus, it doesn't release the lovers into each other's arms. Spencer's goal is married love. Lodge's pure revenge. He's primarily interested in torturing the stony lady and teaching the lesson, and this is number four, that nymphs must yield when faithful lovers stray not, lest through contempt almighty love compel you with Scylla and the rocks to make your biding a cursed plague for women's proud backsliding. 
Now, we can't say for sure that Lodges was the first apillion of its kind in England, mostly because of the difficulty of dating Marlowe's hero in Leander. But it would be typical of Lodge to be a pioneer. He wrote the first defense of poetry in 1579, first English satire, 1595, first translation of Josephus in 1602, and actually then the first translation of the entirety of Seneca's moral essays in 1614, a kind of interesting selection here. Um, so he, he did the first of, of many things, um, though as even his greatest defender has noted, he, he blazed, quote, more trails for others to follow than he left enduring markers of his own. Um, but he was an experimenter and a highly self-conscious writer, sensitive to the poetic scene around him. If Scylla's metamorphosis doesn't mark the point of the absolute origins of the Apillion, it clearly offers an Ovidian ideological myth for the genre, showing its metamorphoses out of earlier poetic revisions of Ovid. Moreover, it introduces the Apillion's central properties and suggests why, for a short time, it became so enormously popular. Following Lodge, the mythological narrative is often framed as a seduction poem. So John Marston's 1598, The Metamorphosis of Pygmalion's Image, uses the story of the softening of the marble statue to try to warm up the poet's own stony lady, while Francis Beaumont's 1602 Salmasis and Hermaphroditus teaches the moral that, quote, all creatures that beneath bright Cynthia be have appetite unto society. In England, the prototype for the unattainable Petrarchan lady is less, less Daphne, the guiding myth for Petrarch himself, than Narcissus, we've been hearing a, a lot about in the last couple of days, and whose story is really everywhere here. Um, now this obviously had the great advantage of making it seem that any girl who doesn't immediately leap into bed with a poet is clearly a pervert, narcissistic, you know, through and through, or like Scylla, a monster to begin with. Um, and it's, a, it's an element, too, of, of rhetoric that I think brings out the connection between these stories in Ovid, the connection between Daphne and Narcillus that, that Philip Hardy was speaking of earlier, and also the, the connection that, I'm, was, that he had on his handout but wasn't able to get to between Narcissus and Scylla. Um, that all of these stories are seen as somehow, as uh, the connection between these stories is brought out even more in the love poetry uh, of this time. Um, so, for example, you know, even in William Barkstead's 1607, uh, Myrrha, the mother of Adonis, uh, an apillion based on the story of Myrrha, um, he makes Myrrha's incestuous desires a, a direct result of her scorning of normal love earlier. So it's a kind of punishment for um, you know, sort of rejecting just you know, sort of the love of, of those you know, sort of nice young men around her. Um, the framing of myths as seduction makes it ro seem rather as if the stories from the metamorphoses are being told by the Magister Amoris from the Ars. And of course in Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis, the mythic figure of Venus from Metamorphoses 10 becomes a version of the preceptor. And ironically, while it's hard to imagine a better authority on the subject of love, she turns out of course to be completely ineffectual. Moreover, Scylla's metamorphosis triumphantly marks the transformation of the cold lady of Petrarchan poetry into the fiery female who rages through the Apillion. Uh, Enone in Haywood's Enone in Paris, Diana in Drayton's Endymion and Phoebe, Aurora in Thomas Edward's Cephalus and Procris, Salmasus in Beaumont's Salmasus and Hermaphroditus, Murrah in Barkstead's Murrah, and the best and biggest of them all, Shakespeare's Venus, who in more ways than one is the prototype for this figure. The popularity of this stock figure suggests that by the 1590s, many were pretty fed up with female chastity in both poetry and even more in politics, especially as the consequences of Elizabeth's virginity, her lack of an heir, became increasingly anxiety provoking. Scylla's metamorphosis uses Ovidian figures to construct a genealogy for the Apillion as part of an Englishing of classical forms. John Weaver extends the line in Faunus and Mellaflora, 
or the original of our English satires, which appeared in 1600, just as the popular genre was beginning to dwindle from revolutionary innovation into formulaic cliché. Like Lodge, Weaver is interested in imagining Ovidian figures coming to England, in this case, Faunus, son of Picus, whose story is also told in Metamorphosis 14 as part of the tales which interrupt and substitute for Aeneas's journey. The story of Picus is connected to that of Glaucus through the figure of Circe, the archetypal lusty lady, who transforms both Scylla and Picus in revenge for unrequited love. The two episodes furthermore represent stages of Aeneas's trip, as Glaucus's journey to Italy replaces that of Aeneas. In mentioning Picus at the specific point, Ovid recalls Aeneas's arrival in Aeneid 7, where Virgil describes the Italian king Latinus's descent from Picus and his son Faunus, and alludes to Picus's transformation into a woodpecker. In the Metamorphoses, the story of Picus is told by Macarius, one of Ulysses' men left behind on Circe's island, where he's picked up by the Trojans, and who's the mirror image of the Greek Achaemenides, whom Virgil had invented to link Aeneas's journey with that of Ulysses. So the three versions of the epic journey briefly intersect in a complex dialogue here. Ovid takes Virgil's ancient Latin and weaves him into a tragic love story in which he's married to the nymph Canons, who, as her name suggests, represents the power of song, and therefore Pica spurns the advances of Circe. While, Sir, while Homer's Circe lets Odysseus return to his wife, Odysseus's, uh, Ovid's more venomous, jilted deity spitefully turns Picus into a woodpecker, and in grief, Canons dissolves into water. Ovid seems to have invented the figure of Canons to shift our attention from the coming of Aeneas to Italy to suggest an Aetian, Aetian for the Italian muses, the Camenae, who are mentioned in line 434. While Virgil's poem tells of the arrival of Aeneas in Italy, Ovid's tells of the arrival of the muses. As Ovid had changed Virgil, however, Weaver changes Ovid. While married to canons, Weaver's Picus is not the epitome of married bliss, but a spokesman for misogyny who denounces women in love. And you see in handout number five, number five there is the, the speech that he gives his son full of advice about, you know, sort of love as, as uh, vice's parasite and women as painted weathercocks, um, a servile sex of wit and reason void. Um, as in Lodge, Circe is written out of the story. When Picus is transformed, it is by Venus who punishes him for his contempt of love, and that's in handout number six. In both Apilia, the omission of Circe makes desire itself the sinisterly metamorphic force. The weaver's narrator, who leaps also to the defense of women, stresses the positive side of this, saying love's excellence, quote, is to transform the very soul and essence of the lover into the thing beloved. At the center of the poem is the debate about the nature of desire, and especially its transformative qualities that preoccupied the poets of the period and made Ovidian's stories irresistible. In Weaver, however, Picus is simply the background for the next generation and the real story, which is that of his son Faunus and his beloved Meliflora. Geographical movement through space from one place to another is thus mirrored by succession in time, the generational progression from the mis misogynist Picus, who frankly clearly deserves to be turned into a woodpecker, to Faunus and Meliflora, the happy and ultimately married couple. Weaver announces a new generation of Ovidian poetics through lovers whose love is reciprocal and even more important, consummated. While Meliflora's name clearly recalls Ovid's Flora, she's a new woman indeed, as Weaver claims when he introduces her as, quote, fair Meliflora, amorous and young, whose name nor story never poet sung. Her amorousness and her immediate reciprocation of Faunus's affection show her difference from the hard-hearted Scylla. However, while Weaver insists that he's telling a new story, it's one that actually looks pretty familiar by 1600. Faunus and Meliflora reads like a kind of tour of 1590s English poetry, its greatest hits, so to speak, though this might seem a polite way of describing what other scholars have called slavish imitation or at best accomplished parody. 
Like other Ovidian works of the time, uh, Weaver's poem crams the single episode with many other stories from Ovid. Faunus decides to write to Mellaflora in a scene that copies that of Byblus. There are many allusions to Salmasus. Faunus looks at a picture of Diana and Actian. Um, and again, picking up on, on Philip's talk earlier, I would suggest that you know Weaver, Weaver doesn't think of himself as someone who's gathering stories that have no connection with each other, but rather sort of he's aware of the connections that exist in Ovid as well. Weaver also explicitly corrects Ovid, explaining that when the sun scorched the earth, it was not because of Phaethon, but because of the sun's infatuation with Mellaflora that caused him to lose control of his horses. Uh, it's interesting, again, thinking of this in light of other forms of correction that we've seen in the last couple of days. This is very different from the kind of confiscation of correction of, of Hesus or um, uh, Mantuan or Fraco or perhaps you know, Dante as well. Um, that this is a, a correction that is done kind of tongue-in-cheek in, in a way to undermine the whole idea of authority. Um, that what Weaver is drawing attention to is that Ovid's is just a story and he's giving another version of the story. In many ways what he's doing is a technique similar to what one might see in the, in the Fasti. Uh, and this, will be, this is something that other writers at the time are doing as well. There are numerous references, especially to the story of Venus and Adonis, which provides a particular contrast for the new love story Weaver is imagining. In this case, however, he's not correcting Ovid as much as Shakespeare. While the courtship of Faunus and Mellaflora is interrupted by the sudden appearance of a savage boar, the beast poses no real threat, as Faunus is able to kill it with a tiny little penknife that he happens to have with him. Moreover, Weaver explains, Adonis was not killed by the boar, but dies of love for Mellaflora. And Venus is really in love with Faunus, with whom Adonis is actually confused throughout the, the poem. And when Venus flees the world, it's not for grief over Adonis's death, as in Shakespeare, but because Faunus rejects her. And this is handout number seven that you have. Um, you can sort of see the, the way um, in which um, uh, Weaver is, is rewriting the story of Venus and Adonis, um, and particularly in the, the section that I gave you from Shakespeare, uh, echoing you know, sort of Shakespeare's end of the end of Shakespeare's poem. As this suggests, Weaver is very consciously summarizing and rewriting recent poetry, including Spencer. There's a scene in which Fauna sees dancing graces that is actually adapted from Fairy Queen Book 6. And indeed, the whole goal of the poem, Married Love, is quite Spencerian. Um, he's also responding quite heavily to, to Philip Sidney, as, as uh, William Keach has pointed out. The central source is, however, Marlowe. Weaver copies the shaggy dog story at the end of the first Cestiad in Hero and Leander when he explains that the love in Faunus's eyes flies to the destinies to denounce men like Picus who attack it. Hero and Leander are the model for Weaver's innocent and rather inept lovers who court each other and after some contrived mishaps and the very long authorial digression that delays the action are finally united in mutual happiness in a scene that itself compresses the more drawn out and a lot funnier actually, consummation in Marlowe. And this is um, number eight that you have on your sheet. You can see, and I, I bolded some of the places so you can see the, the, the verbal recollection there that uh, Weaver is, is distilling uh, a scene that is much longer and as I say, a lot, a lot, lot more fun in, in Marlowe. Um, the goal of Weaver's lovers is, like that of Marlowe's and again Spencer's, a happy, even respectable union. Um, but the marriage of Faunus and Mellaflora is not the conclusion of Weaver's story, which goes on to show love turning Picus into a woodpecker, though again, as I say, he really does deserve it. But Metamorphosis takes a dark turn at the end as the poem moves forward to the next generation. Faunus begins as a son but ends as a father and the originator of a somewhat ambiguous line of descent. Faunus and Mellaflora's son is cursed by the angered Diana and turned into a monstrous satyr. At the end, Weaver returns to the Virgilian source of Faunus and Picus to recall that it is their line that will eventually emigrate to England with the Trojan brute. And this is number 10, and I'm going to read this all out because it's very strange. Uh, so it begins with the, the genealogy after Faunus. Faunus at length begot Latinus, he Lavinia. Aeneas, her from Turnus, took away. Succeeding him, his son Ascanius, and after him, Aeneas Silvius. Him Brutus killed, 
and at our English Dover landed and brought some satyrs with him over and nimble fairies. As most writers grant, London by Brute was named Twinevant. The fairy's offspring yet a long time went among the woods within the wild of Kent, until transformed both in shape and essence by some great power or heavenly influence, the fairies proved full stout hardy knights in jousts, in tilts, in tournaments and fights, as Spencer shows. But Spencer now is gone, you fairy knights, your greatest loss bemoan. Now this is indeed a rather odd translatio and indeed genealogy. Uh, the journey looks Virgilian, but what's been carried across, fairies and satyrs, definitely does not. Um, the presence of, of satyrs, satire, may not be too surprising in a poem that's concerned with generic descent. From the start, the Apillion, evolving out of and against Petrarchism in the complaint, had verged on satire. Lodge's Scylla was published in a collection which included a satire called The Discontented Satyr, and Lodge went on to write the first full-blown English satire, A Fig for Momus, in 1595. Describing hero's disappointed lovers, the narrator of Hero and Leander wryly observes that, quote, some their violent passions to assuage compile sharp satire. Love poetry always leads to satire. In the end, Weaver's Apillion shows that the genre ends in satire as it turns into a satire on satire itself. The narrator protests, quote, I was born to hate your censuring vein, your envious biting in your crabbed strain, a claim that's ironized somewhat by the fact that the rest of the volume in which the poem appeared consists of satires, and Weaver would go on to write more satires after this. But Brute also brings with him from Italy fairies, and specifically fairies who, after a bit of time out in the healthy English woods, bulk up and turn into Spenserian knights. The idea that English fairies come from Italy itself seems, of course, rather counterintuitive. Fairies are generally seen as part of an indigenous popular culture that is opposed to classical mythology. Origin myths will always ultimately reveal, of course, that the native comes from somewhere else. In Metamorphoses 14, the end of Aeneas's journey is his transformation not just into a Roman, but into Indiges, a native god, as he becomes part of the Latin landscape. Weaver's genealogy also suggests how through Spencer, Avidianism and fairies became surprisingly linked in the English literary landscape, a link encouraged further by Shakespeare's mixing of Avidian myth and fairy lore in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Thomas Edwards' 1595 Cephalus and Procris, which weaves together Ovid, Shakespeare and Spencer as well as Marlowe, thus has a fairy interlude in which Procris is taken in by Lamia, Queen of the Fairies, and I've given you that as, as number 10 of your handout just because it's an interesting um, revision of, of Ovid some of you might want to have a look at. Uh, the mixing of the classical and the native is taken for granted in William Percy's 1603 The Fairy Pastoral in which Oberon, king of the fairies, is married to Chloris, queen of the fairies. And there's a fairy huntsman called Picus, Picus the gem of elves, Picus the flower of elves, as he's referred to, who's in love with a huntress named Camilla, who is extract from line of that Camilla in great Virgil told. There's this weird, you know, sort of, you know, mixing of, you know, the, the classical and, you know, the popular traditions. Um, my favorite bit actually is in this work, which is actually completely dreadful. Um, but what's the, the, the part that I think is really interesting and that where it actually addresses Ovid most specifically is that Tiresias comes in to plead with, with the fairy king to give him his eyesight back and we get the story of why Tiresias was, was blind um, that Ovid tells in Metamorphosis 3. Tiresias brings his family with him and he has a daughter, Manto, fine, and a son, Mopsus. Um, so it's, you know, sort of who comes out of, of Sydney. So there's just this, this kind of um, merging of these two worlds, um, you know, that uh, Percy sees as, as really come, have come together. And it's, it's interesting, too, to think about that in light of, you know, sort of other places in poetry in which you have a kind of mixing of this period, in which you have a mixing of sort of fairy lore and Ovidianism. For example, in Drayton, um, who is so steeped in, in Ovid, but then writes Nymphidia. Or in 
Herrick would be a good example of that as well, um, who has you know, just the occasional fairy poem peeking out of what is otherwise you know, a completely classicized um, Hesperides, Hesperides um, English landscape. Ending with the arrival of Spenserian fairies to England with Faunus and the satyrs, Weaver's poem brings me back to where I started, Spencer and the foundational myth of Brute. For Weaver, Spenserian epic is part of the same genealogical line as the Apillion, which is not surprising given that Spencer wrote Ovidian complaints, including an early Apillion, Neopotamus. The line of Ovid, Spencer, and the Apillion also underlines John Milton's mask performed at Ludlow Castle, more commonly known as Comus, uh, which would perhaps give us a last retrospective on the process I've been tracing. Like Lodge and Weaver, Milton follows the movement of classical figures to England. However, the mask sets up opposing models of translatio centered around the two main characters of the enchanter Comus and the chaste lady. Like Faunus, Comus is part of the later generation of the ancient gods. He's the son of Circe, again from Metamorphosis 1314, who's moved to Britain. The lady is an Aeneas figure who is going from England to her new home in Wales in a journey that is both part of a story of personal growth and the expansion of empire. Her link to Aeneas is reinforced by the presence of Sabrina, nymph of the river Severn that she must symbolically cross to reach her destination, who is herself of Trojan descent. She's identified by her birth as, quote, virgin daughter of Lacrine, sprung of old Anchises' line. Now, as in Fairy Queen Book 3, an Ovidian figure turns a Virgilian journey into a scene of seduction, as Comus tries to prevent the lady from reaching her new home. As this suggests further, Milton's classical sources are mediated by the Elizabethans, whose works echo throughout the mask. The figure of Comus identifies Ovid with the seducers in Shakespeare and Marlowe. The figure of Sabrina especially connects Virgil and Spencer, as she's taken from another installment of the History of Britain in Fairy Queen Book Two. There, Spencer explains how Lacrine, son of Brute, is overthrown and killed by his wife for infidelity. His wife then pursues his illegitimate daughter, Sabrina, and drowns her. And this is in uh, section handout number 13, just the first part. The sad virgin, innocent of all, adown the rolling river she did pour, which of her name now seven men do call. Such was the end that to disloyal love did fall. Now, though he included an account in his history of Britain, Milton was extremely skeptical of the myth of Brute and his family, which he assumed had been invented, quote, in affectation to make the Britain of one original with the Roman, um, and which he also said had produced false genealogies, quote, those old and inborn names of successive kings, never any to have been real persons. In his history, therefore, he makes it clear that the story of Sabrina is an Itian of the name of the river Severn, um, that she is thrown into the water, um, and it is then said that, quote, the stream be henceforth called after the damsel's name, which by length of time is changed now to Sabrina or Severn. In Milton's history, as in Spencer and other earlier accounts, Sabrina simply drowns and is memorialized in the river's name. In Comus, however, she actually becomes the river through metamorphosis. And this is the rest of number 13. Sabrina is her name, a virgin pure, while she was the daughter of Lacrine that had the scepter from his father Brute. The guiltless damsel, flying the mad pursuit of her enraged stepdam Gwendolyn, commended her innocence to the flood that stayed her flight with his cross-flowing course. The water nymphs that in the bottom played held up their pearled wrists and took her in, bearing her straight to aged Nereus Hall, who, piteous of her woes, reared her lank head and gave her to his daughters to embathe and lave and nectared lavers strewed with asphodel, and through the porch and inlet of each sense dropped in ambrosial oils till she revived, and underwent a quick immortal change made goddess of the river. So we've come back to female changing, I guess. Uh, the episode from the Virgilian Translatio is itself turned into one of Ovidian metamorphosis, as the scene recalls the baptisms of Glaucus and Ovid's Aeneid, Aeneas in Metamorphosis 1314. However, while Ovid has several figures who turn 
into rivers. I think the closest precedent for Sabrina's change comes from another moment in which he rewrites the Aeneid, turning it into the story of a journey of a female exile. Fasti III tells the story of Dido's sister Anna, who's forced to flee Carthage after the death of Dido. She lands in Rome, where she's treated hospitably by Aeneas, but persecuted by the jealous Lavinia. Warned by her sister's ghost, as Hector had warned Aeneas in Aeneid II, she flees once more to be taken by the river and transformed into its nymph, the goddess Anna Perenna. Like Anna uh, like like uh, Ovid's Anna, Sabrina is the Avidian female substitute for the male Aeneas. Now Milton's poem ends with another journey, uh, moreover. The lady is saved from by the evil Comus and sent on to her parents. Um, at the opening of the mask, a guardian spirit was sent down from heaven to help her. His job done, he imagines his ascent back home through a series of mythological gardens, the Hesperides, the Garden of Venus and Adonis, and finally a garden in which Cupid and Psyche are united. And this is the, the last passage, number 14. This final vision is a glorious mythological compendium that synthesizes elements from Ovid and the Elizabethans to rise above them, just as the spirit and poem go beyond the figures of Venus and Adonis, associated not only with Ovid, but with Shakespeare and indeed with Spencer of the Fairy Queen. We look forward to the next generation, Venus's son Cupid and his wife Psyche, and their children, as the poem moves upwards in time as well as space from the icon of deadly desire Adonis to a happily married couple. The end of the poem thus seems rather Janus-like, to come back to a figure we were looking at earlier today, as Milton seems to be looking back at the line of poetics into which he is asserting himself, and forwards to the Ovidian characters of Adam and Eve, whom Ms. Philip was talking about earlier on, are at the center of Paradise Lost. Thank you. I wonder, could you say a little bit more about the, the literary reception of Ovid's Flora? You mentioned in connection with Weaver, Melaflora, Mel yeah. Is a, a paradigm for married law. That well, that's actually, I hadn't been thinking about that at, at all, but I think it's you're, in yeah. Artistic reception usually is yeah. um, more shading toward the, the sort of prostitute and mm -hmm. the craziness of T.A. Pillow's Flora and so forth. Whereas uh, here it's a, it's a different way to read off. So that is interesting because I think, you know, now that you mention it, there does seem to be a pattern in English and in the literature at the, this point that uh, the writers who are interested in breaking away from Petrarchan models of love and imagining, um, you know, a, a reciprocal love between a man and a woman, um, they do turn to the figure of Flora. That, you know, sort of Weaver in his example, there, there's certainly elements of, of the figure of Flora in the Garden of Adonis in Spencer. Um, and uh, Spencer also um, uh, sort of refers in, in some of the Shepherd's Calendar, sort of both, both Flora and Chloris appear. And I think actually, if I remember correctly, Flora is used there negatively and uh, uh, Chloris positively. I can't, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure about that because there is a sense of differentiation of the two parts of the story. Um, but then in Milton too, at the beginning of Paradise Lost Book Five, when Eve wakes up, there's a comparison between herself and, and Flora. Um, and I think that um, they are you know, focusing on um, the, uh, an interpretation of the, the story of Flora as the, um, uh, the woman who has been transformed by marriage um, and um, uh, who um, is, stands out, therefore, from you know, sort of so many other Avidian women um, whose rape ends up in turning into a, a vegetable of some kind or you know, a, an animal. Um, that, uh, but I think there's also, and you know, I would argue with this with, with Milton as well, um, it's not that easy to detach the positive side of the, of the flora from the, the negative side, and the fact that flora was a name that was used for, for prostitutes uh, was certainly well known. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Uh, Liz, did you want to? Well, it, it's so hard to answer the book, but I was just thinking that within the story of Flora and the Party, um, she says at the end, well, she gives herself as an example of someone who's quite happy right. in her life. But, you know, I mean, she says that. She forgives him. Right. And then, right. yeah, and she says it's okay, and so, and, you know, refers to Gloria. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's in the story as well. But it's not something that's always picked up. I mean, you know, different different interpreters emphasize different aspects of the of the story. Um, and I think, but I think you're right. Is that that's the the slant that for writers with this particular project they want to emphasize. Um, and partly because it's it's hard to find a good you know mythological precedent for you know sort of a, a happily married woman. Um, so and Flora happens to be one possibility. Um. Um, I think Inga first. Mm -hmm. Along those lines, I was wondering whether passage A at the end should be read. So, which passage? Uh, the, the one we were just discussing about the Thomas and then Flora. Right. Okay. Uh, I mean, maybe it's just me, but that reads very much like the, the, the end of Asamatoria 2 and 3, the old lovers and all of these Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Well, I think that's one reason, you know, that's an interesting point of, you know, sort of trying to understand how Ovid could actually be an inspiration for the writers who are interested in, in married love because they take that precisely as uh, a model for a love relationship which is equal which is very important for Spencer. Um, Marlowe, I think it's more problematic. Um, just the end of the poem is, is a little bit darker than that. Um, it seems to be suggesting that this idea of, of equality um, is, is itself a, a myth and a dream. Um, that Marlowe brings out the fact that you know, the, the, the love experience ultimately is, is very different for men and women, um, so that the equality can't last. But I think Weaver is, is trying to um, not address that in, in Spencer also. Just one more question. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering about how uh, the hermaphrodite statue at the end of mm -hmm. um, the 1590 Fairy Queen right. uh, fits in here. And there's there's the, uh, the discharge, the, the Tarkin right. discharge into the Sovidian Union, which is also in the south of Apillion, and which also seems to uh, prefigure in some way that, that union of Cupid and Psyche mm -hmm. at, the end, at the end of Comus. Um, but, but then, of course, it's a kind of cancelled... Yeah. It's a very weird ending. Spencer wrote the end of this book twice. When he first published the book, what happens is that Amoret is this you know, sort of lovely maiden who's been entrapped by this, this evil enchanter, uh, Busy Rain, who's, who you know, sort of represents, you know, people argue about exactly, but you know, sort of seems to suggest again the way in which the, the customs and um, conventions of desire as played out in this period are destroying women and destroying men, too, Spencer, Spencer would say. So she's being tormented by it. And then she's delivered, she's freed from this and in the first version of the poem she's able to be reunited with her beloved and when they're reunited it's this very weird description in which they are compared to that famous hermaphrodite they're compared not just to a hermaphrodite but a statue of a hermaphrodite and everyone's trying to figure out what statue Spencer is is talking about it's a statue in Rome I think he says and um, it's it's the, when Spencer rewrites the book later on, they don't meet up at all. It's as if he feels that he's pushed it too far, that he's, his desire to get the lovers together has made him go overboard and he's kind of glued them together and they can't come apart and he's the rest of the poem is going to be trying to find something that is perhaps more temperate and realistic um, that's my, my theory about why he I, th I think you know he's he, he does something that you know I think is supposed or he's thinking at the time is idealistic of suggesting the reunion and the two becoming one um, but they become two one um, it's too much oneness, and the, the statue, which also I think goes back to the you know Narcissus, um, is is itself rather ominous. I think we should. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry.